Dragon's Dogma 2 is not what you think it is. At least it's not what I think a lot of people believe it to be. I think that a lot of folks have a relatively surface level understanding of what Dragon's Dogma 2 is and what it's going to offer to players, what the experience is going to be like. Maybe they watched a couple mm -hmm. videos from IGN, read a couple articles, watched a couple content creators. Hopefully yep. I was one of those. There it is. But with that said, I think that people don't necessarily know what they're getting themselves into. I've seen nope. a lot of comparisons drawn to games like Elden Ring, and it couldn't be further from the case. So today what I want to do is I want to talk about well, the reasons why I think Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be wildly popular. It's going to receive the praise that it definitely will deserve. But beyond that, I think it's going to be widely misunderstood. Okay. So, All right. hunting packs arisen. Let's begin. Players have grown accustomed to certain mechanics that enable quick reflex actions such as dodge and parries. Yeah. Games like Elden Ring and the Dark Souls series have set a high standard for how movement and defensive maneuvers contribute to the core gameplay experience. These games have conditioned players to rely on these movements as a fundamental tool for survival, emphasizing a solo player's skill and timing to navigate the dangers of the respective worlds that they're adventuring through. Such mechanics... This is actually, like, I, I see where he's going with this, and I think this is accurate, that Dragon... Like, I've played Dragon's Dogma 1 now for, like, over 10 hours. It's really not a hard game. Like, I'm sure on the hard mode it's probably harder, but, like, in terms of the mechanics that you have to have to deal with, it's not like it's... It's not like mechanically challenging in the same way that like Melania is mechanically challenging in Elden Ring. Wait for DLC. You think you think DLC is going to be harder? You could be right. Become a second nature to veterans of these kind of games. I haven't done the DLC yet. action RPGs. Obviously, this isn't limited to games like Souls like, but mm -hmm. other games leverage these similar mechanics, if not most of them do. Yeah. Providing a tactile A lot of games have like perfect dodge, you know, iframes, etc. Because again, I think players are just used to it through Dark Souls sense of control and mastery over the game's challenges. However, Dragon's Dogma 2 takes a different approach to player mm -hmm. movement and defense, diverging from the now standardized dodge and parry systems seen in many of today's action RPGs. In Dragon's Dogma 2, most classes don't have a conventional movement skill, like dodge or rolls or quick parries or anything like that. Instead, the game... You can actually just jump. Like, if they're going to attack you, like if it's a small mob, and it goes like this, you just jump. Fuck them. <laughs> game emphasizes more on strategic form of combat yeah. and leans heavily on positioning, party dynamics, and mm -hmm. preparedness. This distinction sets a very unique stage of gameplay that I'm not really too sure very many people are ready for. Well, I think one really good example of this is like in Dragon's Dogma 1, there are NPCs that you, like enemies, that you cannot damage without magic. Which is like really kind of... Like, almost no games have stuff like that anymore. And one thing that's, like, I'm curious about is that how much of that... Because, like, in 2012, it was a very different era of gaming. And, like, player expectations were way different. So is Dragon's Dogma 2 going to have things like that or not? I think it probably will. Where success is less about individual dexterity and more about how well players can orchestrate their party's actions... Yeah. adapt to the flow of battle. The movement system in Dragon's Dogma 2 is reminiscent of older Resident Evil games or early Monster Hunter games where positioning and tactical awareness play yeah. a crucial role in overcoming challenges. Rather and I think also positioning and having tactical awareness be a bigger factor actually makes a game more accessible because like anybody can sit there and like figure out how to get all their stuff in position and everything. But it becomes really hard whenever you actually also have to be very good at the game. And I think that Monster Hunter probably, like, I'm new to the series, so I'm not really sure about this. But I bet whenever things like Alatreon and, like, some of the Arc-Tempered bosses came out, that a lot of people got really upset about it. Because you can make Monster Hunter really easy to the extent that, like, you don't have to be good at the game at all. Like, you guys watch me play through it, right? And, like, it was only until, like, the last few bosses that you actually have to have, like, a level of, like, presence of mind and dexterity. Because aside from that, you don't really need that. You can just, again, you can just use traps. You can just make infinite things and then eventually come and kill them. And it's a 35-minute hunt, but it's dead. So, yeah. People got super upset with Alatreon release? Yeah, because you think about, like, also with Alatreon, here's another big factor you can't reset the fight. Like, for example, whenever you're fighting the Great Jagras, if you're losing, you just run away and it will de-aggro. Well, you can't de-aggro all a Treon. Like, you're fucking... 
there it, there it is. So yeah, absolutely, it's different. The same with even like the later bosses, like Velcana. Like you can just walk away from Velcana, run away, and then recover. Then relying on our quick reflexes to be able to dodge or parry attacks at the yeah. very last second, we have to anticipate enemy movements, utilize the terrain to our advantage, and strategically place ourselves and our party members to be able to avoid damage and capitalize on attack opportunities. This I think also, like, there's a big issue of, like, gamers with little real-life egos that put all of their ego into a video game. And whenever one of these games comes out, they want it to be as hard as possible because they want to have more of a monopoly on the idea of the accomplishment of it. Because, like, again, like, I don't think Dark Souls... I think Dark Souls 1 is the easiest game. And I think it's the best game, too. I think it's amazing. I would also say that Mario Brothers 3, I think, is harder than Mario Brothers 2... Or sorry, is easier than Mario Brothers 2. But I think Mario Brothers 3 is a infinitely better game than Mario Brothers 2. But Demon Souls was the easiest? Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm just I'm comparing to Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, right? Just the Dark Souls series. Approach encourages a completely different type of engagement within the game's world. We're understanding our enemies' patterns, Shouldn't exploiting have done that. their weaknesses, and synergizing our party's abilities become the keys to victory. A great example of this is shown in clips that we've seen from IGN where they were yeah. fighting an ogre. Mechanics like climbing, pushing an enemy to the ground, and learning its elemental weaknesses Surprise, play a key bitch. role in defeating the enemy. Being patient and not just spamming attacks helps to maintain stamina. Sometimes staying out of combat helps to gain a better understanding of an enemy's attacks. Yep. More action RPGs have conditioned the players to... Think about again how Baldur's Gate 3, because it's turn-based, allowed itself to be accessible to an audience that isn't a like Elden Ring reaction time, you know, eight move combo dodge perfect frame uh, thing game. Like it's able to be accessible by anybody. Press the attack as hard as possible and then dodge or parry at the very last second, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Dragon's Dogma 2 is more about finding the exact precise moments, when to attack, how to attack, what to use and what part of the monster to use it on. And you can I see this like, for example, in Dragon's Dogma 1, like, I'll be fighting an undead, and, like, his health will go like this. And then McConnell will come in with a fireball, and the first fireball will be like, Oop! and then it's dead. Like, the level of, like, difference with resistances and shit is just crazy. I believe that fighting a chimera exemplifies this. The lion's head is the monster's melee component. Yeah. It claws, pounces, kicks, and roars. The snake spews an AoE of miasma around the creature. Mm -hmm. The goat's head casts asleep, long range spells. As yeah. a melee class, you wait for the miasma. You attack the snake's head to get rid of the close range AoE yeah. so that that doesn't become a problem later on. Then you focus on the goat head next, climbing on top of the chimera to cut it off. And then you finish the lion once you've destroyed the other heads. Dragon's Dog. And I also like how in this game, it's like it's... <laughs> I'm, you're fighting a chimera. I'm going to be talking about how it's realistic. It would make sense logically that the fight would get easier over time because you would wear the monster down. And that's the way that this fight works. The more that you fight this monster, the hardest part about this fight is at the beginning. Like, I actually beat my first one of these out in the open world last night. It isn't a game about fighting an enemy. It's about picking them apart. Yeah. I played Dragon's yeah, Dog I like that a lot. That's good. last year for the first time, and I'll be honest with you guys, it felt weird. It felt foreign because mm -hmm. so many games over the last few decades, last two decades of games, I guess, mm -hmm. something like that. Wow, that makes me feel old. But every action RPG that I've played, they have a dodge and parry mechanic. And I would imagine that's probably the same for just about anybody that's watching this video right now. And it feels weird when you go to play a game where that's not standard for every single vocation in the game. Some of them do have it, so if the, that's the something rogue, that you I want, think does, you can something go like for that. those kind of yeah. vocations or classes, and you can get that kind of play style, but this isn't a game that you're carrying all the weight by yourself. There's a party of pawns behind you, and leveraging them and knowing how to work and synergize with them is how you win. And once I got over that, once I really started to understand that and realize that the game is more about taking the time to understand the enemy figure out their patterns, look at the environment around the enemy, figure out ways I can use that to be able to leverage it against them, figure out their weaknesses and exploit them, pick that enemy apart piece by piece. The game just became so engaging and so rewarding. I had this happen, like, there was like a, a thing where it's like there are these two ballista that will shoot at you and you have to like siege a castle 
and there's two big fat boys and there's a bunch of little goblins around them. And uh, I actually died on it. I legitimately fucking died. Now, to be fair, I let myself get killed because the pawn AI bugged out and it killed McConnell. And I was like, well, I don't want to do this without my healer. So, like, I'm just going to let these these things kill me. But, no, no, it did. Guys, it did. I tried to go over the fucking ladder where they have that sword. I, and then I, I opened the door on the other side. And the pawns keep going up the ladder. And they just keep getting hit by the fucking missiles over and over and over. It happened, like, a hundred fucking times. I'm trying to tell them, like, okay, maybe if I go up the ladder again, you'll stop going up the ladder. Maybe if I walk next to you, I can walk you over to the door. Okay, you're not going to do that? All right, fine. I had to go inside another fucking area. And then I had to zone into another zone. And then reposition every character over there and then leave that zone in the tunnel and then come back and then open the door and then they all went through the fucking door. Yes. But this is something I'll say with Dark Souls 1 as well. So I got cursed in the depths of Dark Souls 1 and I spent the last, the next two hours figuring out how to get uncursed. I even tried to beat the boss without being cursed. I was fucked. Then why... It was so fucking annoying. It was shit gameplay. And I remember it. So what do you say about that? And I think the truth is that a good game designer can understand how to create an experience like Dark Souls 1. And a bad game designer will create an experience like Diablo 4. Or like uh, Lords of the Fallen. Or like one of these other games that understands that frustration and having to overcome obstacles makes the game more engaging, but they don't understand how to implement them into the game in a way that isn't just bad. I feel like there's just like such a huge information gap and like a... Uh, like mental gap between like, for example, listening to Kevin Jordan, like it was like astonishing for me to listen to Kevin Jordan talk about like the philosophies that he used for making classic WoW and then go and listen to like, let's talk about Diablo 4, right? It's just, a, it, it it's like a totally different wavelength of existence. It's like they weren't even talking about the same thing. And I think also like in a way they weren't because like Kevin Jordan is talking about an experience and the Diablo guys, I don't want to just single out Diablo. I think it's a lot of games like this. They're talking about a game. And at the end of the day, this was an experience that I will remember. Trying to fight the boss with a broken weapon. And Dragon's Dogma creates that same environment. And that's the same reason why, like, for example, with Monster Hunter, there are a lot of instances of that as well. Like, where there's kind of, like, annoying things in the game. They're not even nearly as annoying as Dragon's Dogma or Dark Souls 1. But they exist in the game. Like, the, the hot drinks. Um weapon sharpness sheathing your weapon like i think it's really fucking annoying but it's part of the game everything is part of the game and if you know how to make a good game those things will not ruin the game rise remove cold and hot drinks by the way yeah but we'll see what they do in in uh worlds right or what's it called wilds monster in the wilds yeah it's part of preparing all the inconveniences to make the experience, right? Yes, and it's inconveniences make the experience. They create texture for the experience. But a bad designer can't see the nuance between good and bad inconveniences. And that's the issue. ...boarding in a way that no other game has really ever replicated other than Dragon's Dogma and then now Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen because there is really no other games mm -hmm. like these. For new players that are coming into Dragon's Dogma 2, the game's unique approach to combat and character roles is going to feel, well, foreign. Unlike many other action RPGs, where the main character stands as the sole hero in confrontation against yeah. bosses, enemies, and groups of foes, Dragon's Dogma 2 introduces a dynamic where the player is part of a team consisting... Yeah, you have to, you have to play this game like you're in the Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, think about what they would do in the Mines of Moria... And, and 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 re originate your mind to that themselves and three AI controlled companions. This shift from a singular focus to a team oriented perspective significantly mm -hmm. alters the gameplay experience and emphasizes the importance of the collective over the individual. Yeah. In most action RPGs, players are conditioned to 
optimize their character's ability, their gear, their strategies, and face the challenges ahead. Often yep. scenarios are framed as me versus them. However, Dragon's Dogma 2 expands upon this concept by requiring players to also manage the vocations, gear, abilities, and even the AI behaviors or the inclinations of their pawns. This aspect means- I'm not sure how much of that you're really gonna need. Like, I, I'm actually, I, I, sometimes I, I wish that I started the game on hard instead of just, like, normal. And I think that if Dragon's Dogma 2 has a start the game on hard at the beginning option, I will go with that option. Because, like, sometimes I feel like whenever you don't have the game on the highest mode of difficulty, you're not encouraged. Like, how many of you guys are like this? Like, you're not encouraged to actually play the game because you don't need to interface with a lot of the systems because you can overpower the systems. Witcher, yeah, Witcher, like whenever you play it on, was it Death March? Like even then it's still pretty easy, but you then have to actually think about what you're doing. It's not like a point and click adventure game. That success in combat doesn't solely hinge on the player's mm -hmm. personal skill or their character build, but equally as well as how they've orchestrated their team's actions, their pawns roles their compatibility yeah. with each other and how their abilities complement the player's tactics become a very pivotal element to overcoming many of the challenges that the game has there is this emphasis on planning and coordination that marks a major departure from the lone hero narrative that we've been used to over the years and this is introducing a layer of strategic yeah. and it, and again i want to make sure that this is like the focus again is that it makes the game more accessible depth that goes far beyond personal prowess. Players must invest time into understanding the strengths, weaknesses, and synergies of the different mm -hmm. vocations and meticulously gearing up and configuring their pawns for all of the tasks that face them ahead. Ignoring or neglecting there. the pawns is not a viable option in Dragon's Dogma 2 as they play a crucial role in both combat and exploration. Well, there you can do it. I mean, at least so far I've been able to do it, but like, I know that like I upgraded all of their shit like two times. And whenever I did that, it just totally changed the fucking game. Like, it, it totally fucking changed things. Like, for example, like, I, I got, like, my main guy, McConnell. I got him to have, like, an enchant for, like, a fire sword. Holy fuck. It's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, it, it's so good. Yeah, the fire boon. Yeah, well, I have, like, the, I have the second level of it. Ability I don't know if it's called fire battle, or not. support the player and interact but with yeah. the world dramatically influences the outcome of encounters and the overall progression throughout the game. Right. For those players who are unaccustomed to managing a team, or for those who just like to have the spotlight being on them, being the undisputed center of attention, mm -hmm. adjusting to Dragon's Dogma 2's cooperative combat mechanics may present a steep learning curve. Yet, this unique approach offers a rich and rewarding experience. It encourages creativity, strategic thinking, and a deeper level of engagement than we're used to with many other action RPGs. By shifting the focus from a singular protagonist to a closely knit team of adventurers, Dragon's Dogma 2 challenges traditional action RPG norms and invites players to explore the complexities and the joys of leading a party through a richly imagined fantasy world. Now, to put this into context... Yeah, this is a big problem that a lot of games, again, have, is like... It's kind of like the esports streamer culture where it's all about playing the game really fast and beating the game and being really good at the game. And I do think that like people have a fixation around being really, quote, good at games and in the process of being really good, like meta. Yeah, meta, meta gameplay, all that like Hell Divers was going through that. I mean, I think didn't the CEO literally come out and say just like fucking stop it, guys. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, think about how an Elden Ring, like, how many different ways they have to solve a problem. Like, really, you don't need to use, like, this meta build. Just play the game, man. When yeah, I just enjoy it, yeah. When I was playing Vocation in Dragon's Dogma 1, I was relatively defenseless against enemy attacks, and I had no solutions for enemies that were immune to magical damage. If I didn't have my party of pawns, or if I had that entire party of pawns and they were sorcerers and rangers, or weren't geared up properly, I would undoubtedly fail quite frequently. Sorcerers are helpless while they're casting spells. They often cannot even move, and they need to have the enemy either distracted or be defended by their party while they're yeah. casting their spells. You are the main character in Dragon's Dogma 2, but you're more than that. You're not the only you're character. Leader. Yeah. I'm going to level with you. I ran into this exact issue when I played Dragon's Dogma Dark Horizon, and that's the reason why I bring it up. Because 
one of the things that I did was completely neglect my main pawn. I didn't change their gear. I didn't upgrade their gear. I didn't search for new equipment or yeah. anything like that. I didn't change their vocation at any point. They stayed on the exact same one. I never swapped any of their skills or upgraded any of their skills. As a result, I started running into walls and was wondering why I couldn't progress, even though my character felt like they were strong and I had done everything that I needed for them. Yeah, like for me, it's kind of interesting to do because like, as I said, I've been playing this game a lot, Grand Blue Fantasy, and like it has the same policy where it's like you can upgrade your, your team a lot. And if you upgrade your team, that will also help you at, on like a meta level. It's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So I went from doing that to doing Dragon's Dogma. So I was actually kind of like used to it. Now you can even AFK. I sure can. But you can't play Dragon's Dogma 2 in a self-centered way. You have to pay attention to the entire party that you're with. And that's going to be something that I think that it's well worth mm -hmm. bringing up. It's something that players need to know before going into Dragon's Dogma 2, because if they do try to play that way, well, they're going to end up finding themselves frustrated when their party continues to fail over and over and over again. Now, one of the other things that I don't see a lot of people talking about either is just that there's so many layers of nuance to the game, and you have to take the time to really understand that. And that is going to be a major barrier of entry for a lot of players, because I'll just give you a random example. Not all skills are created equally. And many times before you go out adventuring, before you go out to do a mission, you may need to change the skills that you have equipped because not all of them are going to be suited for every single scenario that you find yourself in. Sure. I'll give you a really good example of this. I played as a magic archer and the magic archer has this really absolutely disgusting busted skill called ricochet shot. It is insanely powerful. Okay. You shoot it, it bounces, continues to bounce, and like every Hanzo. time it bounces and hits an enemy, it does more damage the next time it hits the enemy again. Awesome. What the fuck? Works great in tight spaces, completely useless out in open fields. Yeah, sure. So having that equipped doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to hunt something out in the open world. There's a I've never had to do that yet. I, I haven't had to actually change what my weapons are or, like, what my attacks are because, like... The other thing is that Dragon's Dogma does the same thing that Monster Hunter does, is that, and also Dark Souls 1 does, is that jumping attacks and, like, uh, you know, falling attacks do a lot of damage. And you can also, like, with, uh, so this is the way it works in, like, Monster Hunter, right? So, like, if you normally jump, you're going to go up and then down, right? But if you do an attack, Right here, it will actually move your character up a little bit, and that's it, right? It's like the hammer. Yeah, well, the greatsword does the same thing. In Monster Hunter, it's actually the same. Or sorry, in Dragon's Dogma, it's actually the same. Where, like, it will move your character a little bit up. So, like, if you're fighting airborne enemies with, like, the greatsword, you just jump and do a jumping attack, and you can hit them. Preparedness that you have to have. Not only just with your character, so but with fun. the rest of the characters yeah. that you're bringing along. It is fun. Making sure that if you're renting out somebody else's pawn, that it actually suits mm -hmm. the things that you're going to do. Making sure to take care of your main pawn, checking your skills and abilities, their equipment, everything. All of that matters. Yeah. And that is a major learning curve. That is a complete departure from what we've been used to in many other action RPGs. And it's something that, well, it's worth talking about. And something that I think compounds with the issues that I brought up earlier is the fact that the game doesn't really give you a lot of direction in this. Dragon's Dogma 2 promises to bring this unparalleled sense of adventure and discovery, tossing aside modern conveniences like quest markers above NPCs for an emergent, explorative experience. Well, it, it, I mean, there are quest markers, I'm pretty sure, in Dragon's Dogma 1 at least. At least in, in some cases there are. But there's not like, for example, with a lot of, for a lot of things nowadays, not in the second one. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. But like, and also like probably in the second one, they have better descriptions of like what to do. Because, like, in some of them, like, there's one thing. It's like, get this item. What the fuck is this? How am I? And, and it's like, I go to track the quest, and it says, oh, it's on you. You have it. Well, no, I don't. It's not my inventory. Where is it, right? Yeah, get a snakeskin purse. What the fuck? Right? So it's like, if you, they probably should have, like, a better explanation if they're not going to have any markers at all. But I, I do think that's definitely a, uh, it's like a more thorough experience. This design philosophy aims to immerse players deeply in the world and... The story is going to unfold not through explicit direction and linearity, but instead through actual interactions with NPCs, actively listening to one's pawns, and having a keen observation 
over one's environment. However, this lack of direction is going to be a serious challenge for a lot of players that are not accustomed to this kind of open world exploration. The game this also happened with Elden Ring. There were a lot of people like uh, stream viewers that said Elden Ring was more boring to watch than Dark Souls. Or, or like uh, Sekiro or whatever, especially Dark Souls, uh, because it was so open-ended and it wasn't a guided experience. It's like for, for like streaming, Dark Souls 3 and Dark Souls 1 is a much better experience to like have people watch than Elden Ring. Sounds crazy, but there it is. It's to hold players' hands, requiring them to initiate conversations with npcs and heed the advice of their pawns to uncover somebody says short attention spans it's actually not that it's like so you know like in final fantasy 7 or 14 you guys remember whenever like i got to like the vault at the end of heaven's ward and like fifty thousand extra people started watching because i remember like the viewer count went up like crazy whenever i got in there and it's because people knew what was going to happen so like with dark souls 3 you know where, like, each experience of Dark Souls 3 is much more, like, on rails than it would be in Elden Ring. So it's easier for viewers to follow because there's a more narrow path that you can take. Whereas Elden Ring, you can do anything. That's another reason why it's easier to follow for people watching. And, like, this is, this is a, by the way, I think Elden Ring's a better game than Dark Souls. I do. I, I think it's way better. However... Um, you know, like Elden Ring's a 10 and Dark Souls is also a 10, but Elden Ring's just a higher 10. This is not a condemnation of the game. This is just simply the way that the stream, like the way that games work on a stream. So like if I say it, this is the way a stream is, that doesn't mean the game's bad or vice versa, you know? Requests and understand the intricacies of the world will lead to like only up was the opposite for players great that are stream content more not that great of a game more play. structured action rpgs players are going to have to read they're going to have to actively listen and that's just not how a lot of modern games have been developed for a very long mm -hmm. time and now this issue is going to be compounded by the fact that the game has well, sparse fast travel options with berry stones and ox carts being very few and far in between such limitations necessitate true preparedness for any journey, stocking up on the right supplies, choosing the appropriate skills and equipment and special abilities and everything that you need to be able to complete your objectives. The realism and survival elements that are introduced by this game and all of these different mechanics are there. Well, here's to a huge one I haven't seen him bring up. The fact that you lose your health and you can't get it all back. That is like a crazy fucking thing. That is a massive difference. Dark Souls 2? Yeah, but Dark Souls 2 does it in a way that sucks. And this game does it in a way that doesn't suck. Like, for example, like, Dark Souls 2, if you have a fail state, your next attempt is punished through that fail state. But, like, in Dragon's Dogma 2, if you do have a true fail state, you just restart back to where you were previously. Like, you're not, you're not retroactively punished for mistakes in the same way that you are in Dark Souls 2. Like, in Dark Souls 2... Your first attempt is going to be the attempt that you have the most advantages in. And then when Dragon's Dogma 2, every attempt you have the same amount of advantages if you fail the attempt. Does that... Like, I, I see there's people that try to draw like this parallel, but it's a huge difference in my mind. Massive difference. Enhance the sense of adventure, but ultimately are going to steepen the learning curve quite significantly. Now, to add to this lack of direction, the game's world is dynamic, so when NPCs can approach the player and give us quests, they also can potentially die, leaving some storylines completely inaccessible forever. And this is going to add a layer of complexity. They are making that not completely true in Dragon's Dogma 2. My understanding is that you're going to be able to go to like a morgue and use some sort of resurrection stone to finish a quest with an NPC. But after that, the NPC will be effectively removed from the game. City, That's my understanding. A wake stone, yeah. Which actions. is like a resurrection well, this item. This feature definitely enriches the narrative and makes the world feel that much more responsive. It's also going to lead to some frustration from players that feel like they're missing out on significant quests or outcomes because of their lack it's of the same thing in Elden Ring. preparedness. Yeah. The game doesn't necessarily give you all context at all given points the desire for genuine adventure free from hand holding that we've seen that's so prevalent in many contemporary rpgs is understandable and commendable yet i don't think that like really like hand holding isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing in all circumstances 
but I don't think that like having it makes a game bad, and I don't think that not having it makes a game bad. I think it's about the way that the game is designed and how the game allows players to intuit what to do in the game. Because like a, for example, I think that like a smart, logical player should be able to intuit what to do in the game without hand-holding regardless. The reality of such an experience in Dragon's Dogma 2 might catch players off guard. They think that they want it, but they may learn that they aren't ready for it. As players navigate this meticulously crafted world, the thin line between immersion and frustration are going to become evident. Testing our resolve, our patience, and our willingness yeah, sure. to be able to embrace a truly open world adventure. Whether the gaming community is ready for this bold departure from convention... And I think that's actually a really good way to say it, is that I think that a lot of games, like, I actually... So I went through and, you know, as I said, I've been playing the game off stream a lot, and... After I stopped trying to play it like a video game and I started trying to just have an adventure, my experience and enjoyment in the game more than doubled. Like, it's, it's no longer about how to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. It's about trying to have, like, a good experience. And, you know, this is something that, like, whenever I play a game on stream, it kind of contrives that experience, which is why, like, I can always look back at, like, the time that I played Valheim and I played that totally off stream the first time at least. Uh, and, and like that was such a great experience for me and I, I really love that a lot and so yeah stop trying to beat the game exactly like yeah just just play the game and try to enjoy it and I think that again that's like the uh, you know goal-oriented gameplay and it's like it's not bad to have goal-oriented gameplay entirely but it's like it has to be measured by like a degree of like a willing suspension of disbelief that you're trying to have an experience in the game like I remember like Josh Strife Hayes talked about this He's like, if you're trying to play a video game, you have to meet the developer halfway with trying to actually engage in the systems and try to actively enjoy the game. Because if you're going to go into a game, you can go into Dark Souls 1 and think it's the worst game ever. You can go into, uh, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 and think it's the worst game ever. If you're like, if you go into it with that mindset. Needs to be seen, but... Undoubtedly, this is going to set the stage for a really unique and memorable experience for those that are willing to adapt and immerse themselves fully. Yeah. Dragon's Dogma 2 is set to give us an experience that players have been asking for for years now. And it's largely something that Baldur's Gate 3 capitalized on. True. A responsive world that responded to our actions, the actions of the world itself, and it just made the game feel that much more engaging. Fable felt that, that way back in the day. But more than anything, we got to own our adventure. Our experience was vastly different from the next player, even though the main narrative was you know, the same, the outcomes of everything that happens in the game wasn't. And we want that. We want more games that are like that, more games that respond to our actions and the decisions. The that problem why we don't have more games like that is that the level of understanding that a developer needs to have in order to craft an experience that's that good is extremely rare it is extremely fucking rare to have a developer that understands that as well as like you know the guys that made classic wow uh dark souls one legend of zelda link to the past um ocarina of time uh dragon's dogma i mean fuck it's so hard somebody asked a question in chat and they said uh what do you mean by that intuition as in naturally know to figure out what or just follow the normal in-game dialogue so you have to open a gate. Well, you walk to the gate and it's too big to open by yourself. And so you should be looking for a lever. And then if you can't find the lever, then you should look in the other areas in this area. And then the lever would be in those areas. Kind of by using just simple logical deduction to solve problems without the game telling you what to solve. Pretty simple. Yeah, we just found a lever. Exactly. And so context clues. Yeah, exactly. Make. That's exactly what this game is going to give us. But... Yeah, game reward also critical have thinking. A lot of the context that many other games give us, a lot of information that gets dumped on us. There's a lot of levels of nuance to a game like Dragon's Dogma or Dragon's Dogma 2 that may be lost on some players, and we really do have to take the time to actively listen, actively pay attention far more than we're used to in many other games. Because yeah, I mean, you guys know like how I play video games. Like at the beginning, I play like an absolute fucking idiot, right? Everybody knows that. Like, I actually prefer games that do like i hate long exposition games i hate them because like i just lose focus and i just can't keep track of everything like i like doing it wrong which teaches me how to do it right you know like i i 
I kind of wish that in like Dragon's Dogma 1, there was like more of a long form introduction to all of the mechanics because I felt like I got all of them right at the beginning. It was hard to take everything in. I don't know if other people feel that way or not. I think PoE kind of has that same vibe too. So yeah, uh, it, it's it's but it's like it's a balance, right? Because like it's not like every game has to be like Pal World where you just load in, you play the game. And like that's not necessarily always a great thing. And it's also not a great thing when you play like Honkai Star Rail and the entire first three hours of the game, you're playing for 20 minutes of that. With all of those conveniences removed, give an example. Something as simple as fast travel. Something as simple yeah. as being able to constantly go back to town as quickly as you need to whenever you want to and then go back to doing what you were doing is a massive departure from what players have been doing for years because in a game like Dragon's Dogma, you can't just fill your inventory with a ton of different stuff. You have to you have very limited inventory. You can yeah. only carry so many things, and you can have your pawn carry some stuff, but they also have limited inventory too. So you have to pay attention to what kind of curatives you're going to bring, what kind of other maybe quest items or something like that, other pieces of equipment, making sure that you're taking the time to equip the right spells and skills and making sure that you're taking care of your equipment and things like that mm -hmm. because the journey is going to be long, and you're not going to be able to fix a lot of these things or change a lot of these things once you're out in the field and you're going to have to walk all the way back or hopefully grab an ox cart to come back and that's not going to be the most convenient thing to do and i think that there are going to be some players that are going to be frustrated with that because it's just not something so somebody brought up new world did that but we all kind of cried why is that different why is the experience in new world different than the experience in dragon's dogma well i'll give you one big example one big example of why it's a lot different is because there are no multipliers for the difficulty in the game in the same way that like whenever you're playing Dragon's Dogma, if you're out in the world and you're trying to go back to town, it could be nighttime. And like now this is now the game is more dangerous. Whereas like with New World, there was no actual gameplay that it created. And this is kind of like what I was talking about, about like good and bad design is that usually good types of design that uh, that create frustration create emergent gameplay. The only emergent gameplay that came out of New World was literally killing yourself so you would respawn in town. That's not a good emergent gameplay. I think they're used to. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. That's just you're so not So it depends on it. how it works. So I do hope that players are a little bit patient with the game because it's an overall experience. We're supposed to be taking the time to really take this game in, and I don't really think people understand exactly how long this game is going to be because of all of these layers of nuance. But also, It'll probably on top be a two hundred hour game, four times the size of Dragon's Dogma: Dark Arisen. It's going yeah, to be yeah, I think massive. probably two hundred hour. So, with that said, take your time. I grew up enamored with the Lord of the Rings. I used to pack a backpack. Yeah, with... for me, like I remember, I played Elden Ring for like a month. And that was such a good... Like, I felt like I had such a great experience playing Elden Ring for the first time. It was so good, and it's because I didn't try to rush it. Snacks and supplies, head off into the woods with my friends, prepared to fight imaginary beasts, explore the lands, claim untold treasures, mm -hmm. and then return well after the sun had already set. Over the years, I have craved a game that could give me a true sense of adventure, an arduous journey where anything could happen at any given moment, and it was more about the adventure itself rather than the rewards at the end. Elden Ring came very close to that. And I believe that Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to take me the rest of the way. This is I think Elden Ring completely solved that. Like Elden Ring Elden Ring was the game and like Dark Souls 1 was also the game where like do you guys ever get the vibe in the last 10 years that it's like oh maybe I'm getting too old for video games? Oh, I think I'm too old for games nowadays. Do you guys ever get that? Like, I thought that, I thought games were bad nowadays until I played Dark Souls 1 and until I played Elden Ring. Like, Elden Ring was the big one. Like, I thought, oh man, maybe I'm like, I'm I'm in my 30s now, like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm still playing games, right? It's like, of course, it's not going to be the same as it was, like, back in the day. But, like, I played Elden Ring and it was the same and I realized that it was actually just, <laughs> a lot of games nowadays just suck and it has nothing really to do with how old you are. Like, Elden Ring definitely was that experience for me. Exactly the game that I've been dreaming of. 
a massive open world for me to explore where my story is told through my actions, where my experience is going to widely vary from player yeah. to player. And I will have next to no context on what to do or where to go. And it's up to me to figure that out. It's up to me to prepare, up to me to listen, up to me to understand. And after playing Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen, I have unlearned many of the bad habits that I needed to before going into Dragon's Dogma 2. I can't tell you how many times I died because I couldn't use a dodge roll, because I didn't listen to my pawns when they said, Bandits stalk the roads arisen. Got filtered in the dead of night because I didn't bring a lantern, or ran out of food and stamina or health Am I the only person because like, I didn't prepare properly. Everybody got mad at me for not having a lantern. Like, I still don't use one. I fight in the fucking dark. Yeah, fuck them. Really. Dragon's Dogma 2 will test players. Not in the same way as Elden Ring or Souls games. It's not the kind of game that's about individual skill. It's a test this of under understanding, strategy, and yeah. preparedness. I don't think that Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game that you're going to be able to just bulldoze through without paying attention to everything you'll not be able to do that or challenges can be won if you hit them hard enough and oh no i think in a lot of cases there probably will be a way that you can beat the game if you bulldoze through it absolutely yeah sure that doesn't but th that it's not a bad or a good thing that's just how it is that was the challenge for me you can almost always do that with games i overcame and i think other players are going to have to as well I recently watched Asmongold play oh, Dragon's oh. Dogma Dark Arisen, and it inspired this video because I wholeheartedly agree with his take on why he doesn't want to stream first Dragon's Dogma. Because yeah. it's not a game to be played without your full attention. If your attention is split 50-50... Well, it's right? also like another thing with streaming is that even if you put and you say, like, don't backseat, you're going to have people that are going to tell you what to do and you're going to read comments and chat that will give you insight into what to do in the game. And streaming the game will change the way that you consume the game as content, right? Or as an experience. So it's like, it's just, you can't stop it. Yeah, no, you're just going to see, like, for example, it's like you're looking for something and there will be somebody that will tell you, oh, it's at the top. Or, oh, it's in the room to the left. And you'll see that, and the problem-solving process at that point is ruined. Or it's done, depending on how you perceive and how you value it. 80-20 or whatever it is, chances are you're just not going to pick up on the context, mm -hmm. on the nuance that the game has. And as such, you're just not going to have a good time playing the game. You're not going to understand the game. Yeah. And you're probably definitely not going to beat it. Now, with that said... I'll give you a really good example to back up this claim. The reason why I say this is because in many games, we have bad habits that have been trained by, in my opinion, poor game design. A really good example of this is Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. I love the game. It's a ton of fun. There it but is. The NPCs in the game talk incessantly. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. Oh my god. Oh fuck. It's so drunk. It's so fucking drunk. It's never shut the fuck up. Why do they do that? Like, why? All useless dialogue, random things that they continue to say. And I really wish that they put an option in the game for me to be able to turn that off because it is so damn annoying. But we've trained ourselves to turn those voices into white noise, into yeah, ambience. I don't even hear it else. anymore. And in a game like Dragon's Dogma, yeah. that is so far from the case, it's not even funny. You need to know and hear what your pawns are saying because if you're... I, that's interesting he brings that up because I actually turned the pawn dialogue back on. Yeah, in the game, I because I, I had it off in the, in the game whenever I was streaming it and I turned it back on whenever I was playing it myself. We're not actively listening to them. There's a lot of hints and a lot of things that they're telling you that is incredibly useful and may hinge on you actually finishing a fight or finding mm -hmm. something or finding a quest or whatever it might be. The game is designed around the pawns to begin with, so actively paying attention to those NPCs is a massive part of the game. A really good example is if you're fighting an enemy and you don't hear them say, we need to attack its head, we need to attack this other part. The or, tail. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the enemy is weak to fire. That's some context that is, yeah. well, pretty important <laughs> so it's really important to be able well, it's to also like if one of them gets knocked 
right? So like in Grand Blue Fantasy, if you have somebody get knocked, there's like an indicator right in the middle of your screen. It's like right here. And it says, this person is knocked, go get them, right? That's it. But like in, uh, in, in Dragon's Dogma, you don't have that. You don't have any of those options. Listen to these characters, understand the nuance of the world, and really digest and understand this game. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that's going to be a little bit difficult for some players. Now, with that said, I do have one thing that I want to say, and I think that this is going to be really important. Dragon's Dogma 2 and Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen are not games to be consumed. They are games to be learned. They are games to be played. Really played. Pay attention, be patient, but most of all, have fun. Because that's exactly what this game is designed to be. There's going to be a learning curve. There are players that are going to bounce right off of it. But I have a feeling that this game overall is going to be received the way that it should be. Which is widely appreciated. I've said this a few times on this channel. Capcom. There will be people, whenever the game initially comes out, that will criticize and get very upset about the way that the design of the game works. And you'll see a lot of that on social media. But I think that three years in retrospect of the game being released, the people that the experience resonates with will appreciate it, and that will be the resounding opinion that people have. Any of your misgivings aside, has been a banger factory. And somebody says they'll get filtered. Like, getting filtered feels like, you know, what do you filter? You filter out garbage, right? And so, like, getting filtered, like, there's a negative implication to that. But there's a lot of people that just don't play video games for that type of experience, right? They want to play the high-reaction Elden Ring type games. They're not wrong for that, right? But, you know, this just isn't that kind of a game. They have widely been one it's not of like the you're wrong for them. very few AAA studios or AAA companies mm -hmm. that are out there that have been pumping out banger after banger after banger. They have been so solid and... It's just so nice to be able to have a company like that that's out there because they set a trend, hopefully, or can try to set a trend for many of the other studios that are out there because, well, they raise the standard for that group of studios. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to this game. I cannot wait to get my hands on it. You know, for a fact, I'm going to be making videos about it. Sure. But yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys can't wait for Dragon's Dogma 2. I know that I can't. But yeah, that's all I got for today. So if you enjoyed the video... Think about subscribing to the channel, liking the video, commenting down below. Join the Patreon if you'd like to support the channel any further. And always try to catch me live. Probably go live right after this video posts, actually. So, yeah, I'll be there. Helldivers 2. I've been nope. addicted to that game. But anyway, stay cool, stay righteous, stay safe. And most of all, I'll see you next time, Arisen. So, peace. Family, family, family. I'm going to pull this up, right? I think that there are certain games that if you play them and you try to speed run them, like your experience will be dramatically reduced. Blasphemous 1. Incredible fucking game. You absolutely should not try to speed run the game. Dark Souls. Dragon's Dogma. Elden Ring. Enshrouded. Hades. I think actually has a pretty good story. I like that a lot. Hollow Knight, from what I've understood. I haven't had a chance to play a lot of it. Maybe Lies of P. No, it's, it's kind of in between, I would say. Uh, Monster Hunter. I think New World is like that too, actually. I know this might be a little bit unpopular, but I actually think that if you play New World and you try to step back from like min-maxing and you just try to like enjoy the game and play the game for what it is, you will have a much better time. Um, Pal World, I mean, to an extent, right? Uh... I think there's one more. A Valheim. 1,500 hours? Yeah, I played the game a lot. Uh, I, I played New World a lot. Yeah, I'll link you guys the video. I, I think this is very accurate. I, I do think that games definitely are suffering from people being, like, hyper-focused on finishing the game and doing it quickly. Like, I was actually going to watch this, this video about it, um, about how, how streamers ruined gaming. Because I do think that like streaming and, and, and everything has had a profound effect on gaming, and that effect is not all good.